coming on your screen now to see that the recording has started. So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's session on the how, the why, and the what of seed collection with CWA Today. I'm delighted to have you join us all for this session. Um, and we have a number of experienced people in this field to share with you their experiences, their knowledge, and their understanding about what seed collection is. Firstly, we have Dave McIntyre, who's the Seed Development Manager with Elsom Seeds Limited. And this session has come about actually after a, a request from Dave um, to share information about a seed collection with our members. So Dave has an impressive CV of forestry knowledge, having worked overseas in South Germany and Switzerland. And since his return to Scotland, Dave has worked for over 20 years in the seed trade, supplying seeds of all size and scales um, of projects. He's joined by his colleague Craig. Craig Shearer, he is Elsom's operations manager and has worked for most of his career in the plant and seed industry and will share lots of information about different ways of collecting seeds with you. And we're also delighted to have Tasha Fife join us from the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust. Tasha spoke at another virtual session this week for CWA and I know that her journey has been significant. So I'll let her explain to you all about that when she, when she speaks. Steve Blow joins us from the Cairngorm Connect. Steve's the delivery manager for Cairngorm Connect and he works with all four of their partners to help ensure that the landscape, landscape scale restoration of woodlands, peatlands and rivers agreed under the Endangered Landscapes and Seascapes programme is successfully delivered. Currently is closely involved in the Montane Willow Species Rescue Project on RSPB Abernethy. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Rick Worrell, who is now a retired, or maybe use that phrase loosely, Rick, retired um, forestry consultant engaged mainly with the native woodlands and managing hardwoods for quality timber. He has collected seeds of native trees and shrubs on and off for 35 years, was employed part time for a few years at Edinburgh University doing research on the genetics of native trees and ran the Birch Group of Forest the Future Trees Trust for 25 years. So a wealth of experience today to, um, um, that we are going to hear from. So we're very privileged to have those speakers today. Um, quick outline for today. I've introduced the people in the order that they're going to be speaking. We'll have roughly 25 minutes each. I want to stop to give you a little bit of a screen break at 11 o'clock. So presenters, if you wouldn't mind keeping an eye on the clock, um, if you're running the risk of going um, over in time and um, then I will give you a little shout five minutes before your time's up um, but that would be really helpful if you could just keep a, clo uh, a close eye and I'm actually just going to take a wee screenshot whilst I'm here just to keep me right. Okay, okay. Um, so moving on I'm going to ask Dave to start. Now Dave I should have explained how you can take control of the slides so if you go to the very, very top of your screen, you've got the red leave button on the right hand side. If you go right to the end, to the left, it, there will be a button that says take control. Oh, there, hidden. <laughs> you got it? There you go. All yours oh. now. Just use your mouse or your clicker to, to, to move slides on. Yeah, thanks for that. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dave, as you've just heard, uh, Elsom's Trees Seed Manager. Um, I've been working here for a couple of years now. Um, I'm not quite sure where the slides have gone right. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so I'll just start off with a very brief history of Elsom's Trees. Um, Proven Plants was formed by the Shearer family in 2020. And the main reason was to provide good quality broadleaf trees from local origin seed. And that's why I'm really delighted to be involved with them. Um, because I've, I've worked for probably 25 years or more supplying local origin seed to various nurseries in Scotland um, from all over Scotland. So we're based at Harper Dean Farm, Haddington, East Lothian. And the first seed collections began here in the autumn of 2020. Uh, we became Elsom's Trees 
in 2022, um, and they've made quite a substantial, substantial investment in the company here. So from a standing start, it's quite incredible to think that we grew more than three and a half million trees in the first year. Um, when I first joined, we had no polytunnels, no offices. <laughs> I think we had a toilet facility, but not much else. And in that first year, we managed to grow three and a half million trees. It sounds quite a big number, but those three and a half million trees are, are made up of quite small lots. Sometimes it can be a few hundred trees. Sometimes it can be tens of tens of thousands of trees in a, in a seed lot. Um, my main role here at the Elsoms is compliance. Uh, that that's quite a big part of my role actually. So I look after all the certification, the seed certification make sure we're complying with the forest reproductive materials regulations. And I also work with uh, a lot of major partners, big estates to identify and gather site specific seed for their own locality. Um, we're, we're trying to create a, an inventory of sites to collect for, from and also mapping these areas. Um, that's a slow process, but it, it is something that we are working on. Um, we want to ensure seed availability of the, what we call the key species, the key broadleaf species in Scotland. Um, a big part of that job is banking seed. So in good seed years, for instance, Betula was, was very good last year in the east of Scotland. So we managed to get quite good collections. And that's a, a seed species that we can bank for the future and ensure continuity of, of supply. The other key thing for me is traceability. Um, that, that's a, a big issue, so we, we want to ensure that everything is traceable throughout our system. Part of that again is notifying the Forestry Commission that we're intending to collect, they, they require a couple of weeks notice before we, we start collections. Um, we do get inspections from Forestry and Land Scotland, which is, I would say in the 25 years or so that I've been collecting seed, I, I'd never actually had a collect, uh, an inspection before. But in the last year, I've, I've had two, and that, that's a good thing. That the, the 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 main aim is to for the forestry and land Scotland. They they have a target set now to inspect at a minimum of ten percent of all seed collections and notify notified collections in in Scotland. And I, I think that's a really good thing. So sixty percent of my time is taken up with certification and NAV, which is our internal um, traceability system, which I'll speak a bit about later. As you can see from this slide, I, I can have hundreds of notifications in at the Forestry Commission at any one time. So it, it is a very big job to keep track of everything and make sure that when our sales manager comes to me at the end of the year and says, you know, I've got 10,000 plants from Populous Tremula from 102, for instance, um, I, I can provide that certificate and ensure traceability on our system. One of the first things I did when I took up my role at Elsom's Trees was create a, a poster map of the UK forestry seed zones. And on that map, we have pretty much all, all the wee dots on that map are places that we've collected from in the past or are, are likely to collect from. Of course, that's quite a time consuming thing to update it on a regular basis and, and moving forward, we'd really like to. 
create a more interactive system and ideally set up a project which can be shared with uh, multiple par participants so that any new seed collectors can use their mobile phone or tablet in the field and download data from us and we can upload the data from them and that that would enable us um yeah just much more easily produce the data and it's much more available to everyone at, at our company here if linked to our internal system with our lot numbers sales per personnel can instantly see the number of trees that we've got available from any specific area just by clicking the, the dots on the map so we're looking for partners to help us to create that system and S SRU, SRUC where I studied for a year a couple of years ago they're quite interested in maybe helping us out with that The other thing is to enable us to just easily create maps that seed collectors can use in the field. So, we, you know, they, they could download maps from us. We can show them where, where the, the actual woodland is. Part of that is also if you have a community woodland, it would be great to map your own sites. I'm sure most of you have probably done this anyway in the past. Uh, this is obviously a, a fictitious woodland that I've created, but it shows you the type of thing that, that if seed collectors can easily access maps like this, it makes it much easier for everybody. So the key species for us, um, the key species for us are, are these, um, hazel oak, alder, birch, willow, rowan, and Scots pine. We, we grow tens of thousands of these every year. Other species, elm, gean, and elder. The ones that uh, Craig's going to talk about a bit later are the, the willow, the gean and the, the elm. And of course, the montane species are becoming increasingly important in Scotland for upland uh, woodland restoration, things like Salix laponum, the mountain birch um, and other upland species. So, so these, these are increasingly important for the forestry reproductive, re reproductive materials regulations um, high elevation sites consist of uh, sites above 300 meters but when we talk to people at cairn gorms connect or gus routledge and people that are working in these upland sites uh, they they talk about sites above you know 650 700 meters so these these are becoming increasingly important to collect from Favourite part of my job, of course, is getting out and about and actually gathering the seed. It's a bit of a standing joke now that every time I go out the office, uh, somebody will put a notification up to say there's cakes available. <laughs> but uh, so I don't really mind if, if I'm out and about in a landscape like this. And this is actually on sky last year, 24 degrees, no midges, fantastic crop and very lucky to be able to carry out that work in these conditions. Not always that good, of course, can be wet, cold, midges, very miserable. <laughs> um, this is actually at one day later on Sky and just horrible. And of course, I had forgotten to bring a midge net. <laughs> so you take the rough with the smooth. For a company of our size, it's yeah, there's there's only one of me, so I'm, I'm I'm working with one volunteer basically. A lot of the work I do is Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays with my my wife, who's a volunteer. <laughs> uh, so she he helps me out quite a lot. Um, 
the the downside is you have to travel. I mean, I did actually travel thousands of miles last year to collect seed from all over Scotland, from away up in Scourie, uh, the Solway coast. It's not the most efficient way to do things. It's environmentally not great, and we miss out on cakes and office banter. Uh, the the better way or the way forward as far as we're concerned is to try and build up a network of what we would call spotters. They're, that's a very important thing for us, spotters out and about all around the country um, and seed collectors who, who are working in all the different seed zones. So people are required in key places around the country who can determine if there is a collectible crop. It saves me traveling a few hundred miles. And then as I did last year, went across, traveled across to Artornish and very little, if any, birch seed available. So it's good to have uh, people who have the knowledge and the, the skills and can maybe just take a photograph out in the field and let us know if there, there's actually collectible crops available. Uh, even better is to have seed collectors in these areas that save me doing all the traveling as well. Some, some zones like uh, zone 202, we have a lot of people out in the field that can do the work for us. Other areas, we, we just have to take a chance and go for it based on information from, from nearby zones. The good thing for a seed spotter is there's always things to look out for throughout the year. This year, especially uh, male hazel catkins, I think that's about the best I've ever seen. Um, so that's a fairly good ind indication that we might get a good hazel crop. It's not a, it's not 100% um, guarantee, of course. You can look out for things like one year old Scots pine cones at this time of year. Uh, blackthorn flowers. Good for mapping as well, just to, to notice these things and take a note of where you, where your blackthorn is available. Blackthorn flowers, of course, not always a, well, it doesn't always guarantee that it's going to be a good crop. And the same for aspen. Um, this photograph of aspen was taken a couple of weeks ago up in D side, but it's not to say that the, that there will be a collectible crop of aspen because aspen rarely sets seed. And apart from that, the, the the female trees might be five or ten miles down the glen, so they don't always set seed. We're obviously requiring huge quantities of seed for a company that's growing. Well, this this year the production plan, I think there's over five million trees that we're hoping to grow from broadleaf species. So that that's a a huge quantity of seed that we require on, on a yearly basis. The sector at the moment is currently dependent on one major company. And of course, we want to work constructively moving forward with that company, but we also need to build up a reliable seed collection network of our own. And I think the CWA is well placed to develop that collection network because the, there are groups all over Scotland who can assist us and we can assist them. We can grow trees on for, for them, for their projects, and we, it, it's a two way thing for us. So training and seed collection is required. A little bit of that later on today. Uh, we, we've, we're starting some in-house training for, for some of our guys in the company here. Uh, the photograph was of Jack, who normally works in the production hall. And we just think it's a good thing to get some of these guys out and about so they actually know where the seed is coming from and what they're actually dealing with and giving them the skills so that we can occasionally utilize these skills and, and gather our own local seed. I also work with volunteers, but they require motivation. <laughs> Uh, again, this is my wife. If she wants to go for a nap for a couple of hours, it's difficult to say, well, we're working today. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, she does occasionally work quite hard, I would say. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. 
basic equipment for seed collectors out in the field. I mean, bas basically, you don't really need a lot to get you started. Um, it's things like buckets, sacks, mesh or cotton sacks are good. Mesh sacks for acorns and things like uh, pine cones. Uh, cotton sacks for berries and things so that, you know, breathable sacks is, is a key thing. So you're not just stuffing things into polythene bags. Uh, I've recently discovered boat hooks when I, I went up, up to Sky last year. Um, boat hooks are lightweight. They enable you to reach up to about two metres. And uh, they're just so lightweight that I never actually thought about getting a boat hook before. So we are constantly learning as well. You have to think about if you're collecting large quantities of seed transportation methods. If you're keeping your seed in a, in a shed or whatever for more than a few weeks, also think about mice proof storage facilities. Um, ladders and climbing equipment are advantageous if you have these skills, but you obviously need the proper training for that. Um, it's good to be able to climb into the crowns of trees where sometimes there's a lot more seed, but uh, uh, yeah, as I say, that's a specialist skill. If you have a cold store, fantastic. <laughs> this is uh, the cold store up at Glen Elg, where we, we temporarily stored the rowan berries, um, but cold seed, cold beer, best of both worlds as far as I'm concerned. And you also get happy volunteers that are more likely to work the next day. So I can highly recommend Glen Elg Organic Microbrewery to anybody if you're up that neck of the woods. When the seed's collected, of course, there's so many different types of seed that need processed in different ways. Berries have to be depulped and extracted, uh, the seed extracted. The seed has to be stored appropriately. Things like acorns and willows, when they arrive at the nursery, they have to be dealt with fairly quickly or put into cold storage, temporary um, cold storage. And all the seed requires a master certificate and at the end of the day, so that's a, a very key point. Um, we always weigh all the seed as it comes into to Elsom's here, um, we allocate a seed lot number for our NAV, our stock control system. This is kind of what our stock control system looks like. So each seed lot gets a number as it comes in and as it moves through the system to a cell or is graded into 10, 20 centimetre sizes, whatever sizes we've got, they, they get a new lot number. But these lot numbers are traceable all the way back to the original seed lot. If you're collecting lots of large seeds like acorns, as I said, in good years, it's possible to collect large quantities of these seeds in a relatively short space of time. Think about your transportation facilities. If you've got a little mini, it's not going to cut it. <laughs> um, even with our camper van, I was looking at this lot and thinking, are, are we going to get this in the van? <laughs> and yeah, I don't want three penalty points for overloading either, That's which has happened in the past. Sometimes you get lots of seed, sometimes you get no seed. This is a a mountain birch collection we were hoping to carry out with uh, Gus Routledge at about 700 metres in the Cairngorms last year. Um, but luckily, other parties and other locations managed to source some of the seed for us. And the agreement was that we could get half of that. So as far as I'm concerned, that's great. That's good cooperation with everybody. Everybody's happy. Um, and some of that high value montane seed or mountain birch seed is currently being processed at Elsom Seeds, our parent company. So don't worry if you don't manage to collect any seed or even just 
getting the information that there's no seed available from different parts of Scotland is valuable information for us. And somewhere in Scotland, there will be seed that is collectible from one of the species. Um, I'm sure about that. So there's always seed at the end of the rainbow. And I'll pass you back now to Sharon. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dave, is there any questions from anybody in the audience just now? Please do just put your hand up or put anything in the chat just now. Dave, what I'm keen to know is um, your seed collection network. How can people find out specifically about that? What would be the best um, way for anyone interested to um, know more? Yeah, do, do get in touch with us because we have uh, lots of information leaflets available that we've been working on here at Elsums and uh, Craig Shearer, um, you'll probably get more information about that when he um, gives his talk in a few minutes. Perfect, thank you. Um, Maybe I could get you to put an email address in the chat for me if you if you would, that would be helpful for people yep, to absolutely, up. yeah. Wonderful. So we've got no questions just now, but but um, please, folks, if you do have any questions as we go, just interject, put your hand up, and we'll make this conversational as as we progress through, through the morning. So, Craig, would you like to take um, the screen over your? Oh, you've done it already. Well yes, done. Thank right. you. Excellent. I was poised and ready for it. I'll just <laughs> good, make good sure that I do know what I'm then doing. Yep. I think I'm in. Right, so uh, yeah, I'll just continue then. So right. thanks there, for Dave, for that introduction. And I'll take over from here on. I'll show you a little bit of what we've done with the seed collection project we, uh, we're doing with Woodland Trust. That is now sort of moved over to Trees for Life and now uh, running the volunteers. In the first two years of when Broken Plants became Elsom's Trees, I was running with both trying to sort of get here started up and continuing with the volunteers and it was sort of getting a bit too much. So it's been amazing that Trees for Life are going to take that on. Ros Birch is, is doing some great things still on the West Coast. The project isn't so focused on the East Coast. So again, it's something that we might sort of try to look to sort of mirror image with other organisations, maybe like as yourself. And we are still working with the project. So we as Elsoms are still doing all the seed processing and well, all the sort of the data, the FRM things. So Dave's still involved in that. So we are still heavily involved, but we'd like to see how this project can sort of continue. And we also want to now be starting to look at the sort of a bit more of a commercial element on it. So it's been great working with volunteers on that side of things and getting that network going, but can we now be thinking of getting this network going with actual individuals that have woodlands for themselves? And there can be a bit of sort of income from it. It's it's a tricky one that you're not going to become rich from seed collecting is, is the one thing I will say, but we're trying to work with organisations where we can then be providing the trees straight back to them. So really taking it as your time going out uh, doing the seed collection, you know you're going to get that genetic resource back and we will sort of give a percentage of free trees back and things. So we, we think that's a great way of doing it, as well as trying to get to sort of pay some local contractors and things. So it is all about just finding the right people because it's it's a tricky gig when the main bit of the seed collection is over. So it can be sort of two to three months. Your, your September, October is a real sort of busy time. So you're never going to get professional seed collectors because how do you make a, a, a year round living just by doing that? So it is really about us trying to find the right individuals, people that maybe run across to the rest of the time and might have a bit of, bit of spare time. And, and even if we get to the point where they couldn't do the seed collecting, as Dave said, to get valuable spotters out of there would, would just be amazing for us as well. So what I will do is sort of go through. So one of the presentations we done when we had the, the seed collection project was so we, we met up with the volunteers three times in the year. So this was our early spring one where we went through the elms, willows and cherries. We then done a later season one when we started to talk about getting ready for oaks and hazels. And then we done an even later one again that was around our sort of pine collections. So it was about trying to keep sort of volunteers engagement. And the one thing we've certainly learned from the project is to get a lot more focused on things. I think volunteers certainly need, need that exactly how much we want you to go out and collect and we need to make sure we're collecting the right things as well 
So I think with the volunteer collection, one of the species we'll go over today is our, our cherry species, which are very difficult to source in large quantities. So if we had a multitude of people out collecting, 10, 10 small collections from a seed zone can be put together. So I think we do need to look at minor species in a slightly different way. We're not going to be able to go to one woodland and get it all collected in one go. And it is a slow process. But I'll sort of go through the sort of the, the, the collecting side of things. So here we see elm, willow and cherries. They, they certainly are our, our early season ones. Elm, I would say, is the, sort of the first one that you will be collecting, whereas the cherries and, and willows, we're now just starting to see flowers form on them. I know our little Salix reapings on the nursery, they've already got catkins coming on it, so it does show spring is, spring is starting. And we've got a little species ID. We've we done it on sort of every species. Everyone, I suppose, does recognise a witch elm, but it's again, I think it's always about sort of building confidence with people. And if you do then have that little, if we have that slideshow sort of saved on your computer when you're out and about, it might just give you the, the, the confidence to go after it. Obviously, once the seed is formed, it's very recognisable. So here's a photo of it. So this isn't ready for collection. You can see in this the central point of the, the leaf structure there, the actual seed itself. That little red dot is the seed forming. If you go to that and you gave it a squeeze, it would be very, very soft. So you do know at that stage, this is not ready for collecting, but at least we know there is a seed source coming. And then from that stage, around a few weeks later, they start to dry up and you will see something like this. And that's the sort of stage where we would then be looking to, to, to start the seed collection process. We find with Witch Elm, it is a very poor sort of viability. A lot of the seed doesn't actually form. So a lot of the time when you're collecting it, you might collect a, a sort of huge sack full. We find that when we, we will just sort of uh, scatter sow that over seed trays and sowing it very very heavily and you will sorry you will just get a sort of a normal amount of plants coming from it so as a species to sow and if it's a little bit of community growing and things it really is a brilliant species for that because quite recognizable you can grab a lot of the seed and it is a case of you popping into that seed tray and then a couple of months later you're transplanting from that seed tray into what would be its final growing cell so and a quite a quick process and unlike some of the berry species quite a, an easy process so move on to goat willow which i would put into one of it's probably one of the sort of trickier ones to collect on the timing side of things so it is a species where spotters would be amazing for us especially once we get into the montane ones where if you're going to be go walking up four or five hundred meters you kind of want to know that the seed's going to be be ready but it is always no two years are the same so this photo here so it shows so you see here the green catkins which have not dehissed yet so dehissing is what we see in the background there so that's a white candy floss style uh, material that has the seed inside of it. So what we want to be going out, that there is a really a perfect, a really good time to start collecting because you know some of them have dehissed, these other ones are almost there. You see the sort of seed bud swelling. So so we know there we are going to get, get a seed source from that. The one tricky thing again with the willow it is identifying your species. So as you see, we've got the three Three main, the key species there, where our sort of lower altitude one. We always say with the the willows, you you start off at the lower altitude with your goat willow. It moves into the grey and then higher up. Generally, it's the eared willow before we then start moving into some of the more niche, um, like liponums and arbusculars and things. So I always think with willow about yeah, what altitude we plant at and what altitude we then go sort of collecting at. It will sort of help you find the species, but getting out and about before you go collecting, before it's that stage that you've seen previous where it's ready to collect, to get out a few weeks before and to identify the bushes you do then want to collect from is, is a key. And you can see there's, there is ways to sort of identify them. It is again the sort of thing you want to carry your wee cheat sheet with you have the years I've been doing it, I still get a bit of the fear before I collect and sometimes I double check check the information and it's I always think with tree species it's 
trying to find your own sort of little cheap ways to remember species with, with the eared willow it's it's quite a nice one because it's sort of it's got that ear sort of lobe to it with the wider point as you say there at the top going to a thinner again with the grey willow I always think grey willow is that's our salix cinerea so you think grey and cinders and our groat willow is our capricorn I always think think of your goat as a sort of key and it's uh, as I say it's it's almost a, a nice wee test to yourself as well as you're out and about am I am I going to get these locked in my brain or not when you would hope year to year you'll remember but I would say in general a refresher every year is 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 always handy so this is the really early forming catkins so if you're out and about just now you will start to see this site this is a this is a little salix bit Mineralis actually just a local one so this again isn't one of our capreas cinereas aritas so again showing you the sort of difficulties with collection that there is there is a lot more species than than just the three we've mentioned here again there's that the catkins de hissing and a little bit more of a close-up so you see the little little speckled dots there that that's the seed so it is yeah, we once we get the catkins and stuff into us here, we still have quite a big process on that. We the Woodland Trust actually funded um, a willow propagation video last year. It's now out there. It's on YouTube, and it's sort of showing you how we do it with very basics. So we've got Forest Art, which obviously have quite fancy machinery. We we use a Henry the Hoover in the clip, which. It's, it's a basic way of doing it, that you can go through that, that it is about sort of hoovering all the fluff out and trying to separate the seed. And then in that video, we sort of show you then how to sow it because with the seed being so, so small, we have to mix it with sand and you sort of broadcast sow it across. And I always find the willow amazing that from sort of a gram of seed, you could be looking at four to 5,000 plants from it. So it's a really, it's a good one that way, considering you then go to things like oaks and hazels when from, from a kilo of seed, you might only get 300 plants. So it's so it's a, a real sort of difference in scale and quantity. And again, a species that you'll see out and about just now, I'm sure, is the two, well, certainly down here, maybe not further north, but the cherry is sort of out in flower at the, at the moment. So it's a really, it's a real good one for, again, getting your species ID. If you're out and about this time of year, it's when you can be sort of looking around and seeing it forming and then making your plans for later in the season and and cherries are species we would love to get more sites of as i say it is one that you really only find little pockets of it in woodlands so it's a species i think we have to think slightly different for for and we're even sort of looking at I have to choose my wording correctly with Rick here and things with our seed orchards and stands. I always think I'd like to be looking at setting up almost source identified stands and could we be thinking in different ways of how we could be getting larger populations of cherries for the future and when it comes to seed collecting there's a lot of things we could be doing now that are for 15 20 years down the line but it's almost if you don't do them now it will never come around. So there's and that's the seed then starting to ripen you see that nice sort of red red tinge to it but you also see in the background some of them still a little bit orange there so there's no sort of hard and steady rule i would say on seed collecting i know with rowan i was always told never collect it until it's september the whys of that i don't know are so scientific but it's about sort of learning your species and you find the best times to collect them. And I'm sure it's something that a lot more research could go into about optimum collecting times, but it's it's a big project that would that would take some time, but well worth doing. And then we are onto our bird cherry there, which is also forming at the moment, which seeds should start coming soon enough. And here you see it, and we've got it sort of broken down into the different stages. So with the the the, the Prunus padis there previously, you're you're collecting the red ones. Here we're looking for the darker ones. So stage one, it's red. You see stage two there, where it's uh, that crimson colour you'd call it, and then on to stage three, the nice dark seed that is that's ready for for getting out there and collecting. Another species that is sort of under undersupplied to the sector and it is a bit of a seed issue so it's it's 
it's heartbreaking at times when you see schemes and we're not getting more of the bird cherries and things into it and it is that the, the seed source isn't there so the plants aren't there so then we just end up putting more of the birches and alders and rounds in so to be doing something to make these more available would just be a, a fantastic thing for ourselves and even just the industry in general and our local environment if not the, the most important thing there getting more species planted is key Again, a little sort of photo of the two different leaf shapes. Again, I think when you see them side by side, it's nice and simple to see the differences. If you were out and about before seeds formed and things, you, it might be a bit trickier. So as you see, the one under the bird cherry there with the much more serrated edges. And so sort of always there's always sort of hints and tips with all seed shapes, whether it's serrated edges or multiple points on it and things. And, and as you sort of learn more species and looking at them in a bit more depth, I think these things do become a bit more apparent and you, you start again just finding your little knacks of, of knowing the difference between ones. And again, a wee bit very similar to so almost what Dave was saying before with the equipment. This is maybe just a little bit more on your sort of the, your health and safety checks. Even if you're out and about yourself, I know that it's not you're you're not a company or anything, but I think you always want to keep yourself safe. So so recording anything that you're out and about doing, and just making sure your clothing's correct. Make sure somebody else knows where you're going. I know we're all adults, but it's always worth sort of mentioning. I think. And that was a sort of well through the that's the species we certainly have available at this moment. As I say, there's there's plenty more of them and things. So whether there were some questions before we, we go into our break, maybe. And. We've got a question from Tasha in the chat, Craig, asking where we yeah. can find the Willow YouTube video. I wonder if you could. I've had a wee look myself, but I can't see it. So maybe if yeah, you could. Yeah, I think when I just sort of type in it. Willow propagation and Woodland Trust that came up. Woodland Trust haven't yet sort of made it sort of put it out as a sort of like online to people, but it's certainly on there. I'll have a wee double check and maybe I'll, I'll write it in the comments. That would be how, wonderful. How, how I could. seem to find it. Thank you. We are we are now looking to do another sort of string of the videos. So we're going to start looking into some of the other sort of other minor species. So I think over the next few months we're going to be doing that. So hopefully they're, hey. they're well received. Brilliant. I've got a question from Steve. When you come, Steve. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of collecting from, and this is more with my kind of the local woodland, community woodland hat on, um, uh, whether you have to have the site registered for seed collection uh, to... No, to not if it's not just a, not if it's just a region of provenance collection. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the site itself doesn't have to be registered. We we would have to, or, or yourself, if you've got yourself FRM registered, um, you would just have to do that notification. And making sure you do have the landowner's permission is is key on that. So we've got a little signed copy. We get we get people to just to sort of double check, uh, just covering ourselves really, and we, we keep that on record as well. But it is about just getting that notification in before you go collecting. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice one, Tad. And I, a, a real practical question here, but from an insurance point of view, Craig, who is responsible for anything that might happen to any of the volunteers whilst collecting? Through the Woodland Trust project, they were all signed up through the Woodland Trust. So that was all through their volunteer ring there. And now that's now moved on for Trees for Life. And I think it'd certainly be worth having a sort of conversation between the, the two parties on the certainly the volunteer aspect of things we we what we done a couple of years ago we had a couple of people that worked for trees for life and we actually for our seed collecting we actually just employed them on sort of a one hour a month contract and we just sort of paid through the year and then what we done that way was once they then done a large bit of seed collection they obviously got paid the rest of it then and then that way they were then covered through our insurance right. on that side of things so it's something that definitely needs planned out before you go out collecting for sure and certainly if we were teaming up on things we, we would need to make sure we have have those sort of things covered prior to it but I can certainly get you in touch with Roz at Trees for Life now and things to see how, how they go through it. Great thank you for that. Um, Rick do you want to come in? Yeah I just want to raise a, a, an issue with with Dave and, and Craig about this issue of what is a kind of a collectible amount of seed because you can have very little seed uh on a tree or in the wood or you can have a lot of of, of seed 
in a wood and in a year when there's a lot of seed then there's no decision to be made you know it's a collectible amount of seed but you have this question thinking on behalf of your spotters or your collectors it's a difficulty i've come up with is trying to uh define or 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 or, or or tell people whether this amount of seed is is worth collecting or not. And I just wonder if they wanted to comment on that because it's something that you know. I, I know it's difficult for me. I'm sure it is for you as well. But it's worth people being aware of. Yeah, okay. and I, I think the big thing with that is what we think is a lot of seeds, and what other people think is a lot of seeds are, are very different things. So again, us getting that relevant information out prior to it. For us, it's getting it out as many trees as well. I think the amount of trees we're collecting from is as important as the amount of seed that we can get. So I would never want us going out and getting a lot of seed off of three trees in a woodland and stacking up. So it really is about making sure we get that genetics. We, and it is, I think, species by species. I always say a dozen is a my sort of, I like to be at least 12 trees I do collect from. And I think it is about getting that information out prior to it like species by species, what is the minimum amount of trees? And then we do also have in one seed zone, we could bring collections together. So just to say if one area only has six trees, but if we had a few different areas like that, that we could bring together as a collection. So it is, again, I think we, we need to do a bit of work on that to show what's our sort of minimum and maximums. And, and if it was only a half a dozen trees, we would need to find another population somewhere near close by to bring that number up. But and certainly for us, for the amount of seed we sow, our container, our 96 and 126 is the number of cells we have in one of our growing containers. So for us, for growing it on, as long as we've got a nice mix of trees we've collected from, we could grow anything down to that number. But uh, it is, it's about the genetics. That is the key thing. And I think it's almost when you're out and about as well, just dragging yourself away from that good tree. You'll find yourself as you're walking around, you get that spot and it's almost like, no, I need to I need to move away now and find find another one. So it's yeah, it's a really good question on that, Rick. And one, it's there's probably no straight and hard answer on it. There is there needs to be a bit of wiggle room, but always sort of when it work into minimum standards, I think is the key of it. Um we've got a question from Tasha Craig. Tasha, and you come. Um, it was just to do with the master certificate. So if you've got a stand of 12 trees um, and then another one or another collection of birch is a mile away, but still in that same woodland, do you ha can you still keep the same master certificate for that whole collection? Yeah, and when you, it's right that when you're registering it, Dave, you have to say if it's from multiple collection sites. I think that's still the wording on 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 the on the website now. Now it's all online. I've I've had less to do with with that side of things, but Dave's on that. But I think I'm I'm right in saying that, Dave. Yeah, that that's correct. I mean, we all all we need to do is 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 note that it is a collection from multiple sites, and we can register it and get a master certificate for that as as one whole seed lot. Craig, could I just ask, as a lay person who has no experience of this whatsoever, if you find a tree that um, is bountiful in seeds, would you strip the tree completely or would you leave a percentage of the trees for, for the local, obviously for regrowth in the, in, oh, in the local? Amazing question and one I should have covered. In general as well, with the 12 trees, I also have around about a 20% rule I try to stick to as well, that we wouldn't take more than 20% off of that one tree. You'll find, especially in sort of buried species, you're not tall enough to get more than 20% off the tree. So a lot of the time it might be a wee bit sort of focused where you're getting it from, but I definitely don't strip a tree ever. It's, it's, and I'd say it's even more so important on the sort of buried species because again environmentally we want to make sure that seed source isn't just getting completely taken away so but I would always think as well with the 20 percent it's near impossible to get more than well some trees you could maybe like a small pine you could get around it and take every single cone off but in general I'd say you're hard pressed to take more than that from the one tree and we don't want you doing that anyway so it's again a good way to keep you moving. Perfect thank you. 
Um, thank you both so much, um, Craig. That was really informative, and it was great to see the photos of the different species. And yeah, I can uh, hear your pain about the not sh the, the fear that really <laughs> really tickled me. Because yeah, I, it doesn't matter how many times you look at a tree standing on its own to try and identify, you know, the type of tree. Never mind the the different variants within a type of tree. It must be a challenge. Uh, so thank you both very much and sharing that information from Elsums. I I'm going to come back to you both because I think it would be really useful for our members to have something in one of our bulletins or our newsletter. So I um I, I might come back to you for some input there. We're ahead of schedule, folks, but I think. Um, I know how I'm feeling. I want to get up and move about a little. So we'll take a, a 10 minute break and come back for 11 o'clock. Folks, welcome back. Um, what we'll do is we will uh, now move on very swiftly. I've just realised I've made a, an error in the agenda. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. We might run over by a few minutes, but hope that hopefully that's OK with you all. Um, so Tasha, welcome. Thanks very much. Hi, can you hear me OK? We can indeed. Okay. Um, I'm far more used to uh, talking to trees rather than on computer screens, so my technology abilities are <laughs> limited. So bear with me when I have some technical issues. Um, I should have the first slide there. Um, can you see that okay? And indeed, yes. Great. Um, so uh, this is the Isle of Egg Tree Nursery. Um, we set up in 2018 was the year that I managed to get this first big tunnel up um, and as soon as I got it up I realised that immediately we needed more space so <laughs> it's been every year has been a massive learning curve for me. Um, I had yeah I guess a bit of background um, I'm employed by the Elevag Heritage Trust, so I'm very lucky to be employed. Um, and it's to um, have a um, supply of trees. Um, fundamentally, we set up to have a supply of trees for our own planting projects on the island, which I'll talk about as we go on. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any formal training as such. Um, I'm definitely not an expert and have been learning an awful lot. It's been a huge learning curve all the way through for me. Um, I think, yeah, I would definitely say I'm no expert and um, have had no formal training at all. My main experience <clears throat> has come from just living on the Isle of Egg actually all my life and observed the changing landscape since uh, being a child and um, that's really quite a unique experience, I think, actually, just living here in one place and um, sort of casually observing, I guess, the changes of seasons. And um, through that, that's given me just a passion of being outside and experiencing weathers that are quite uh, uh, erratic <laughs> and also um, more recently, obviously, there's climate change and the difference in environmental, um, you know, you start to observe the differences between one season to the next and especially since setting up the tree nursery, it's been a real, um, you know, it's honed in my um, observations, I guess, because you're co collecting seeds and just watching what's going on in your own garden and then walking around the whole island collecting or or just taking the dog for a walk and um, you just casually observe so much. Um, I've got my next slide. So um, this is Egg from above. Um, we are uniquely positioned on the west coast of Scotland. Um, we're about 13 miles from the mainland, so 13 miles uh, boat journey from Malig. Um, and we um, had a community buyout in 1997, so since then um, a lot of work has happened to um, look after our island and keep things moving forward in a really positive way and increasing our population. At the time of the buyout um, we had 60 residents around there and now we're, we're hitting something like 120 mark of our residents. 
um, all year round as well, which is a really important part of, of the community. Um, it's not summer, winter, that's all year round. We have at least 100 people living here all year. So um, important um, projects that's happened since then has been the um, electric system, which you can see in one of the slides there is the windmills and the water from the hydro. And we also have um, PV panels. Um, and so that's a unique um, electric supply that has been rolled out across the whole island. So all households are now on this uh, renewable energy scheme. It's quite a one on its own uh, unique system, uh, very complicated, and uh, but it all provides us 24 hour um, electric. So from renewable sources, it's just brilliant. Um, within that, from day one, we've also, as a community, um, inherited the uh, woodlands, um, which is a real, um, I mean, we're just so lucky here. Uh, it's like a, it's such a diverse and rich variety of wildlife um, and ecosystem uh, and a vast amount of uh, species for a uh, west coast island um, and there's pockets of Atlantic rainforest and uh, also pockets of ancient uh, hazelwoods uh, which is just really interesting to see the lichen and different things that indicates it's an ancient woodland and um, again that's all just I'd be learning this really more so over the last year of the indicatory uh, species that are growing in, in a woodland and the lichens that are even on the barks of the, like the hazel, it's a beautiful lichen that's almost like a snake skin. Um, I didn't realise that that was, I thought that was just the bark of a hazel, but actually that's the indicating factor of it being ancient. I think, I mean, Craig can maybe keep me right on things like that. I'm still learning. Um, we've, um, yeah, I guess so. Oh, hang on a minute to move on to my next slide there. Um, so here is um, <laughs> our technical document of the long term forest plan. Um, it's a very dull document and um, really quite heavy going when you've got no experience in woodlands at all. Uh, so, yeah, this was the first thing that I um, sort of started my woodland career, I guess, as a director on the board of the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust. Um, the Long Term Forest Plan was uh, being created and <clears throat> within that, um, yes, there's some facts down the side there where we've got 13 compartments and 24 hectares of forest land, all managed by the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust, so it's native woodland. Uh, mature policy woodlands and commercial forestry plantations. So it's a real mixture of um, uh, woodlands that we that we look at actually on egg. Um, and also now within my job as a tree nursery manager, um, it's, yeah, it's a lot to take in and run into a plan that um, once it was um, approved um, with the Scottish forestry, it's been brilliant because it's made the process a bit easier, but also as soon as you start doing anything, um, things don't run to plan. <laughs> so there's changes that we've had to make on the harvesting projects and now the restocking of, of areas as well. So keeping up with the uh, paperwork side of things uh, from collecting the seeds with master certificates and also um, through the Scottish Forestry and also keeping on top of all your mapping, just as um, <clears throat> Dave McIntyre and uh, Craig Shearer was discussing there. It, it, that takes a lot of focus and I had no idea about all that stuff and that's where I'm trying to balance the tree nursery side of things, but also all the paperwork um, all myself. I don't, it's just, we have a small staffing resource on the Elevate Heritage Trust, so um, juggling all these things has been um, very exhausting and really eye-opening. <laughs> um, Tasha, 10 minutes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a quick, uh, quick fast pictures of we have Eggwood Fuel, um, all small businesses from the Trust. Um, 
what the wood fuel uh, processing area, which is actually where the um, tree nursery houses in one of those pictures. It's very small, I can't see probably. Um, anyway, um, then we have a whole um, program of harvesting. And obviously with that, what trees come down must go back in. So um, that's where I created the tree nursery. Um, and yes, that's just been absolutely fantastic over the years. Um, next slide there is, um, uh, that's me trying to take a picture of myself um, collecting seed. Um, that's why I've got a funny uh, uh, posture there. Because <laughs> I was trying to run back and collect the alder seeds um, in time for the timed picture to go. So that just shows I'm, I'm kind of collecting seed a lot on my own and um, I'm trying to integrate volunteers now to help me out in, in set, set times of year that's the most useful for me. But I've been doing it all myself since um, 2018. This um, gives you a wee kind of idea of hazel collected there and then planted into the root trainer cells and, and then uh, magically things grow, which is even more exciting when you've actually had all that hard work to um, collect your seed and you've managed to keep it safe over the winter from rats and mice and things like that and um, and then things actually grow which is yeah it's the biggest delight in the job for sure. Um, resources um, yeah there's like a yeah, as I said there's a massive variety of species on egg which is fantastic I would say one of the most important things um, that I've learned um, is observation and record keeping. Um, having a diary or some source of small notebook, not small notebook that you can have on you at all times to write important things down, not just um, I had biscuits, a really nice biscuits with my cup of tea today, or the flask of tea was still hot when it came to four o'clock in the afternoon and you were wet through in the field. Uh, in the woodlands somewhere um, and yeah the most amazing network has been um, just tree folk it's such a an amazing network of folks uh, there's the Facebook uh, small tree nursery network I think it's called I can't quite remember my technology is not great um, but that Facebook uh, group is just brilliant because it's all keen enthusiasts um, trying to grow um, trees in their tree nurseries in small communities, very small um, tree nurseries and that wealth of knowledge between everybody asking a question on there and you get answers back, it's just phenomenal. Um, I'd also say that uh, obviously Community Woodlands Association has been fantastic for us and um, setting up and, and keeping on the advice. Woodland Trust also um, and Ascent, the uh, Corgich uh, tree nursery up there, that's been fantastic. And going and visiting these small places is, uh, yeah, phenomenal for for trying to get the uh, quick, fast, um, how not to do things and how to do things for you. That speeds the process up massively. Uh, Noidart community as well have been phenomenal in advice for us. Um, and helping out with our harvesting project, we, we brought uh, um, Noidart to help us out with that. Also with the Elevate Heritage Trust, we're partners with the Scottish Wildlife Trust and the Highland Council. So that's two other organisations that have been great along the way um, as a community buyout and for the tree nursery. Um, and um, GIA Development Trust are, are are just getting together, doing a lot of planting projects as well. For the tree nursery just now, I've been trying to set up um, a bit more sales so that I can increase my income coming in. Um, so it's not just um, providing trees for us on our own plant planting projects. Um, there's also really lovely things that goes on. Um, so Reforest in Scotland is another excellent advice and resource. Um, Barra and Uist um, have just had a delivery of trees from us um, through the Woodland Trust that's gone out to all the crofters um, in Barra and Uist 
And through that, it's just been, yeah, it's a, it was a phenomenal process to go through for me. Um, exhausting, but um, for uh, advertisement, as it were, of our retreat nursery, that's been phenomenal. Woodland Trust has is, is been amazing. Um, Five minutes, Natasha. Thank you. Um, through that, I've found out that there, um, I've discovered that there was an ancient trade routes between the Herbardine Islands for nuts and berries, which is, um, yeah, I just love the kind of history of things. Uh, and also, yeah, so I've got this book. I don't know if you can see that. Is the um, I can write it somewhere so that people can see, but it's a handbook of Scotland's trees and it was produced through Reforest in Scotland. That's been my Bible, I would say, since setting out. Um, slide. We've had woodland creation projects. Um, the first big project that kicked off was the woodland creation project. Um, that was, again, massive learning curve for me. We had to have 17,500 trees ready in one year, which was nuts over 2020 and 21. Um, with COVID, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. had volunteers. Like everything was cancelled. I had to plant the trees in myself. Um, me and my dad. The first year, second year, we managed to create employment and employ um, locals here, which is again another um, outcome of the tree nursery that I hadn't fully uh, grasped when we set out. And and providing local employment is just amazing on such a small island. Um, we've also more recently been restocking the forestry plantation um, and that again is uh, yeah it creates employment at a funny time of year when there isn't employment on the island. Um, I'll just quickly run through these slides because we're running short of time. Um, education and learning that for me personally my education and learning in this process has been phenomenal. Um, and now linking in with the Egg Primary School and other community groups, like I said, um, and that skills and information sharing within the tree nursery network is, is so phenomenal. And uh, you guys at Elson Trees has been a real key person to help me in the process of being able to ship trees off island because that in itself was an insane journey to go through. Um, which you'll see in this uh, next slide here, the sales and delivery. Packing up those trees um, in January and getting it all packed up onto pallets so that I could then get it down to the ferry by the tractor onto the CalMac um, uh, lorry that comes off and takes stuff um, freight for us. And then seeing the boat sailing away, I was just weirdly emotional. It was as emotional as uh, waving my child off to high school. <laughs> it was one of those key uh, moments of, uh, you know, like personally with my daughter, but in work with the my babies, my baby trees leaving the island was, um, yeah, just phenomenal experience to go through. Um, and my final slide here is um, you can't really see the writing there but I was just trying to say the future is bright. There used to be a saying of the future is orange I think it was through some uh, orange mobile network or something but um, this gives you an idea of where our tree nursery is. You can see the polytunnels there with the wood fuel processing shed uh, beside us and we're just uniquely positioned right in the middle of this forestry plantation. So our um, footprint um, of travel for our trees going back out onto the island is very minimal and the least amount of impact that I can find in any other project, I guess. Um, the travel, like um, Elsom's were just talking about going and collecting seed and everything, we have it all here on this very small island of six miles by four miles. Um, and yeah, I guess over the years, we've kind of proven our identi identity as a strong united community since 1997. It's been really hard and challenging mentally and physically, but we all share a unique bond 
with nature on egg and off egg and um, all the connections through that is amazing and through nature music culture and history and now technologies being able to do these kind of webinars it just brings pure joy and tranquility in equal kind of measures there um, and the opportunities that it brings for for our community and also other small communities via the network is yeah it's grassroots um operations that are going on here uh, really is grassroots um and the people power i find that phenomenal the power of people is um incredible when you come together and what you can achieve um and that just actually gives you even when you're tired or when your back is sore like it is mine just now and um, it, it really gives the energy to <clears throat> stride forward and uh, keep all these amazing, amazing people and projects um, on the go for the future, because that's where it's all at, I would say. So I wouldn't say the future is orange, the future is green. That's me. Tasha, thank you so much for that. I, I don't know about you guys, but I find that story so heartwarming that the, the trees that, you know, like they are your babies, aren't they? They are, they're yeah. grown where you've grown up and they're, you've seen, watched them, you've harvested the seeds and you've planted them and grown your trees and send them off. So I just think it's wonderful. And you are extremely privileged to be in the situation you're in because it's so unique. So um, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Folks, about running um, short of time. So, if you have any questions for Tasha, if you wouldn't mind asking Tasha them in the chat, and Tasha, if you could pick anything up from there, that would be wonderful. Um, we're going to move on quickly to hear from Steve, who is um, who works for Cairngorm Connect. Steve, do you want to take control of the slides? Okay, dokie. Yeah. Magic. Thank you so I'll much, Steve. That. On you go. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, I shall. There we go, the button's working. Um, so yeah, my name's Steve Blow. I'm the delivery manager with the Cairngorms Connect uh, project. I work sort of for RSPB, um, but uh, I am kind of acting support of all four partners, Wildland, RSPB, Nature Scott, and Forestry and Land Scotland uh, across the partnership area. Uh, here is the partnership area. Um, the land is, is contiguous kind of um and that really came about when fls bought Roth, uh, part of rothy mercus estate and that kind of j linked abernethy in the north the blue area a little bit of nature scott uh land at del uh, delwood next to nethy bridge all the way through um the fls land holdings uh to Invereshi, uh nnr uh nature scott um inch marshes is part of the the Angles Connect area as well, so we kind of largely kind of woodland and upland, but the the river systems are, are just as important. Um, uh, and so, Inch Marshes is is a is a really good example of that. And then into wildland, uh, wildland is um, the so private privately owned by Anders Paulson. Uh, about four estates make up um, that, and uh, that's about sort of half of the overall project area. So we have charity sector, sort of a couple of government organizations and private sector working together um, on 600 square kilometers of land to restore um, the, the habitats that are, are there. Uh, we are focusing primarily, the work that I'm involved in particularly, um, on uh, delivering kind of woodland expansion uh, mainly Downey Birch uh, and the Willows, both um, at sort of medium and high level. Uh, Dwarf Birch, Common Alder, Aspen, Bird Cherry, Hazel and Holly. Um, those are the main species we're, we're targeting. Um, excuse my lovely cough that I, I have uh, been developing perfectly for today. Um, uh, Scott's Pine Realm, we're not we're not having to do we're not doing many other sort of any other berry type species or the scots pine the the pine and rowan are, are moving uh beyond the forest edge naturally um so as part of uh the work that we're doing we're not having to worry too much about those um there are other bits of planting that that for example rspb abernethy are doing within plantation areas where they're restructuring plantations uh, at lower altitudes uh, and they're getting um, different trees grown for those those lower areas, including rowan and stuff. But for for us and for the work I'm involved with, uh, with the tree nursery, then then we're not doing that. Uh, so 
concentrate first on the willows. We've kind of obviously seen some of the, the information from Craig about sort of the gathering and, and everything. Um, this is very much a species rescue uh, bit of uh, bit of work. Uh, this is Lochan Basin, which is part of RSPB Abernethy. It's behind Cairngorm Mountain, um, nice and remote. It's so like a, a few hours to walk in and, and to walk back out again. Uh, and they had, as is sort of, I suppose, the case in quite a lot of the Cairngorms, isolated pockets uh, of uh, Salix Laponum, the downy willow, um, little bits of uh, wurtle leaved willow, which is the Mercenites, and then uh, an individual plant each of dark leaved willow and tea leaved willow. So a population really very fragmented, very limited. I think when uh, Beck Stenny here in the photo went out and did the survey, she came back with identifying 37 kind of individual plants. Um, so of the Laponum and then just literally a handful of the, the others making up the, the rest of the species in the thing. Totally genetic, uh, geographically separate. Um, some of the patches were all boys. Some of the patches were all girls. They were so far apart that they couldn't um, cross pollinate anyway. So that that population was really functionally extinct. Uh, and so the decision had been taken just just ahead of Cairngorms Connect sort of project starting, if you like, uh, to uh, gather cut cuttings. Um, take those cuttings, pop them in the tree nursery, grow them on. Uh, and so material was gathered both from the Lockham Basin. So we have that kind of genetically distinct population from from the, uh, from Abernethy itself, um, but also uh, wider uh, into wildland, onto wildland at Glenfeshi, uh, Gaik Estates. Um, Marlodge, uh, NTS, uh, are very involved in, in very, very, you know, in the, in the same work just to the south of, of Abernethy. Um, and uh, and Dromocta as well. Uh, there were some plants that Trees for Life had gathered from Dromocta. So we've kind of we expanded expanded the net a little bit to to bring that in from uh, bring those species um, a little bit more genetic diversity from the plants that were actually grown on in the nursery from Lochan. We actually found there was only twenty nine actual individuals. Um, there was a few clones in in the in the basin and a few hybrids. Uh, and the advice when you're looking to get a kind of genetically uh, sort of a viable population is you want at least kind of 50 genetically distinct plants within about a quarter of a hectare of, of each other in a quarter hectare block. So that was our, our starting point for how we were going to uh, restore that population. Here's just a little map of those um, locations where we've been gathering material from. This is kind of all species um, that we're gathering. So uh, Lochan Basin, I think, is all these guys up in here. Uh, and then we've also got some of the wildland uh, areas, the Dromocta population, um, and sort of lower lying species, uh, species more recently. So we've been getting some creeping willow uh, from Inch Marshes uh, and from Abernethy. Um, and we've also been getting stuff like hazel uh, from Craig Craig Moorwood in, in RSPB Abernethy. And that material generally, particularly with stuff like the birch, where we've got a little bit more of a choice of where we collect from, we are um, we're aiming to plant sort of at higher altitudes. So all of the seed that we're getting, or as much as possible, is coming from sort of 300 metres and above. Uh, if we're really, really stumped and we don't have that kind of seed source at, at those higher altitudes, then we will go lower and we will look uh, more widely to to gather stuff generally within the partnership area because um, that's very straightforward. Um, but as I say, we've kind of gone a little bit outside and Rothy Mercus estate uh, been very helpful. And we've kind of worked with with Craig and Dave last year um, to to go out and gather some uh, birch seed and I think rowan seed from uh, from the higher ground on, on Rothy Mercus estate as well, which is kind of in the middle here. Uh, so the material has gathered the cuttings that we took from the from the basin kind of uh, got taken away, popped into the tree nursery, uh, either planted into the field beds um, or into cells. Uh, and those have been identified uh, individually with the little tags so we know who they are, where they've come from. And importantly, when we then go and plant stuff back up into the Lockham Basin, for example, we know 
um, how to get the correct mix uh, of plants around that those kind of remnant populations. So we know we've got a mix of girls and boys. Uh, we know that we've got um, a uh, a bit of genetic diversity from from different seed sources as well. So the plants that we keep in the nursery, um, they do sort of produce catkins, so that's really handy. We can also get cuttings from that material, which would just produce clones of the same same plant. So uh, obviously gathering seed is the, the the way forward if you want to produce new new plants. Uh, and then we also gather cuttings from eared willow, for example, um, and they can generally they they'll get planted straight out onto the reserve, so um, straight into the ground. Uh, but we have also done some some eared willow in in uh, in cells as well, sort of last year. Uh, for the trees that we want to gather seed from, uh, it's really important that we just make sure they're physically separate um, from other willow species just to try and reduce the risk of hybridization in the in the seed that we collect. Um, so we've got two areas. One's an old tree. Uh, one's an old. This is an old dog kennel um, at uh, Forest Lodge and the other one is the old tennis court Forest Lodge. Uh, and we keep um, the Mersonites and the Laponum sort of physically separate. We've got a, a, a mix of species, uh, sorry, a mix of individuals in there uh, and we can collect seed from those um, uh, and that gives us a really good seed source. Obviously when, uh, as Craig was mentioning, when the seeds are kind of like it's a whatever six mile round sort of uh, round trip to go and collect seeds and you're not necessarily sure exactly when they're uh, ripe or not, then then bringing it down, having that kind of exit to sort of population uh, to, to gather from is is very useful for us. Uh, so seeds collected, uh, we use the um, yogurt pot uh, trees for life method to bash the, uh, the the seed about a bit and, and separate the seed from the fluff. Um, uh, works quite effectively on the sort of small scales that we're we're kind of processing material uh, and then it's just sewed onto the, the trays uh, and when you zoom into that picture you do see lots and lots and lots of teeny tiny little green things so the seed literally it has to be uh, collected split sown within a few uh, within a couple of days really uh, and then the trees grow on and then uh, are pricked out into the uh, cells um, generally stuff like that if it's a bit more a bit, a bit, a bit rarer then we're tending to put it into cells um, but we do also have material in beds. We'll put cuttings into the field beds. Uh, and if there's anything that doesn't really kind of get big enough to get planted out um, one year, then we might pop it into the, the, the field beds to, to grow on a bit. Um, but particularly for things like the, say it's Laponum, the Mersonites, the things that we're wanting to plant up high, um, we're likely to be planting those after all the snow's cleared. Uh, so probably very late May, early June, uh, and then uh, sort of on through the summer, so having the stuff growing in cells gives us a lot more flexibility for our planting. Some of the other species that we're dealing with, um, aspen, uh, as mentioned, it's uh, unreliable. We got we did get some of the seed that got um, produced in that last sort of good seeding year, I think, in 2019. Um, so that was really handy to get us started. And then we have subsequently been uh, using seed or pre-sown seed trays from Trees for Life uh, from the aspen that they're producing kind of in the polytunnels um, at Dundragon. So that's been really good. And in parts of the reserve where you know, all of this is kind of happening in the presence of deer, we generally aren't using protection, but in this case where the aspen are, are in, in forest and getting a bit nibbled, then they might pop a little bit of protection on uh, to try and reduce the the impact of, uh, of deer. But generally, uh, across the, the wider partnership area. Fencing isn't used. It's, it is all uh, down to deer management. Six minutes, Steve. Thanks. Ta. Um, Downy Birch collection. Uh, so on the hills above Glenmore, um, this is David Blair, the tree nursery manager, uh, just collecting from uh, from the Downy Birch uh, on the hills. And like I say, we're collecting above 300. Some of these species uh, and over the back of the hill, I've got a photo in a, in a second, um, of these kind of higher isolated kind of pockets uh, of trees. Um, we're kind of interested to see uh, as we gather, gather from these and, and as the discussions with the, the Mountain Birch project go um, forward, whether we actually start to kind of be 
we've been collecting and growing, but we haven't necessarily been um, kind of doing any genetic testing or anything on, on some of these species, but there's a bit more interest in, in really finding out uh, what they are now. Um, and there's a load of uh, conifers in there which have now been chopped off because that's another one of the, our projects is just trying to do a sweep for all the non-natives through the area. Um, collecting sort of catkins or uh, the strobiles, I think, only for the for the birch. So um, we'll go around uh, staff, volunteers, um, we'll do the collections, uh, whether they're kind of super ripe like this or a little bit younger, a bit greener, uh, and take those back to the tree nursery where they get dried off, um, cleaned up a little bit. Uh, and because we're just using it sort of ourselves, then um, we'll just pop them in uh, sort of paper or, or jars over the winter uh, to collect them. And then last um, autumn, I had a bit of a play with doing some seed bombs and, and clay just to see if we could kind of give them a little bit of a helping hand if they get scattered out on the hill. Uh, this is the Alp Mulach, which is on RSPB Abernethy. Um, these individual trees dotted through these are the kind of some sort of very old downy birch so you can kind of see in, in these landscapes um the numbers are relatively low but the viability of the seed coming off the trees is maybe not so good and the ground vegetation is quite high so we are lucky we've, we've gathered seed from these um grown trees on in the tree nursery and then planted out around the the the, the original parent trees just to try and kind of re-establish some uh, some new trees in that landscape. Uh, dwarf birch uh, is one that's working really, re really well. Um, there's uh, in this picture of the landscape, there's hundreds and hundreds of dwarf birch trees across this this hill. Um, so we're not stuck for uh, genetic diversity of plants. Uh, they've all just been kind of been kept uh, nibbled down by the deer uh, over the, the last sort of few years. So. Um, in places we've put some protection on just to try and see what the difference is. But in reality, the deer management that's been happening the last sort of six years has really started to uh, disrupt the patterns of, of deer behaviour and movement. So actually the, the, the protection that we've got on now doesn't seem to be really making any difference compared to whether you're in a cage or out, out of a cage. Uh, so uh, so that seems to be uh, working in working in our, our favour. Um, and then it is just sort of scattered through um, the the heather. So it's a, a question of finding it best in the autumn time when the leaves have, are sort of changing uh, to yellow. And we use the um, tree nursery volunteers, a, a fantastic bunch that are uh, really kind of keep everything uh, running. We went, took a, a Land Rover uh, trip out with a load of volunteers and uh, they kind of comb the hillside and look for the, the plants where we're just gathering a little uh, collections of seed off the off the plants there. Here's our calendar. Um, so all the way through the win winter and into May, we'll take the willow cuttings. Um, we'll be generally collecting seed from the willow catkins in June or July. Uh, and then, excuse me, um, August, we'll be going to get in the bird cherry, uh, downy birch and hazel in September, alder and dwarf birch in October and then November, December, holly. I think we've still got some holly that's just sort of stratifying at the moment. So we haven't got much of that in the tree nursery, but we should get some couple this year. Uh, and a couple of pictures of the tree nursery itself. Um, as I say, the volunteers are, are crucial. We have two members of staff, both part-time, uh, David Blair and, and Lynn Cassells. Um, so they're three days each uh, uh, generally, and um, they oversee and supervise the volunteer work and support uh, and then uh, again just we'll we'll keep everything sort of ticking ticking on uh, as I say we've got the field beds uh, where we sow the seed and then we've got the cells where we grow it on and as part of the endangered landscapes program sort of funding we've managed to invest in a second polytunnel with some irrigation that's made life a lot easier uh, and more reliable uh, and then just coming on to the planting, we've got seed source establishment trials where we're planting sort of experimental and seed sowing uh, to try and get trees established in the landscape. Um, but these are part of wider planting polygons, so there will be more planting kind of in and around that. But that's being monitored by the uh, Cairngorms Connect Science and Monitoring team. 
And when we're planting back into Lockhart, because uh, it's a bit of a tricky thing, if we've got a large number of plants, then we've arranged willow walks where we get uh, staff and volunteers to, to come along. Uh, we load them up with a load of trees and we walk in uh, to the landscape and then contractors have been planting the trees um, because it's a it's a little bit more of a, uh, of a of a kind of mission to get to the places where the trees need to be. But even some of the ones that have been planted are producing catkins, so we're hoping to see some natural regen in there very soon. Uh, and this is the kind of the long term vision is a photo from uh, southwest Norway where we've we've got quite close ties with um, Nina and Duncan Halley out there. Um, so run sort of regular visits and we're looking to to establish um, these kind of mixed diverse willows, birches, dwarf birch kind of communities. That's going to be a little while off, but that's the that's the plan. Uh, and that's the end of my bit. There's the area. Well done, Steve. That was a perfect timed and um, really, really informative. I had absolutely no idea about the genetics of um, seeds and plants and and actually the whole conservation thing is just incredible. So a terrific job that you're doing there. Um, really informative and wow, what a what a context to be working in as well. Something special indeed. Um, thank you. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. And again, folks, if you have got any um, questions, please put them in the chat for, for Steve. Rick, your turn. Thank you very much for taking control of the slides. Over to you. Thank you. Oh, OK, can everybody hear me? Yeah, the technology is working. Indeed. Yes. Good. So I've been um, collecting seed of, of native trees and, and selling to nurseries for the last 35 years. Uh, it's an interesting sideline to my main business. It's a it's a useful thing to do and it's often fun and, and rewarding and, and some of the best work memories I have now that I'm retired come from from doing seed collection. So this is a picture of uh, me and my family collecting acorns in the wood not far away from my home in uh, in Aberfeldy. And this is what uh, 1500 pounds worth of acorns looks like when sold to Elsoms as it was. Um, and my teenage sons bought their first laptops from the proceeds of, of seed collection. So that was all, all good. Um, it seems very odd to me that over the years that forestry and conservation professionals in general have paid so little attention to seed collection with a, with a few notable exceptions that we, we've heard about this morning, even though it's obviously of fundamental importance. Um, and then I've got to get sideways on here. How do I do that? Now, technical issues here. There we go. Um, in the early years of, of me collecting seed, this guy popped up. So this is Dave, Dave McIntyre, and he was a qualified climber and a very useful guy. And he and I teamed up and, and had some very notable seed, seed collection adventures around the place. And sometimes we made a little money and, and sometimes we didn't. Um, but the focus at that time was very much just supplying local provenance collection of, of native trees and shrubs, because that's what there was a need for, and that's what there still is a need for. Um, and back then, there were perhaps even fewer people involved with uh, seed collection than there are now, and there's, there's still a need now. And one thing we speculated about quite a lot back then um, was whether it was worthwhile or, or even feasible to make seed collections for timber species by collecting seed from better form trees. So what we mean by, by better form trees is basically ones with a straighter trunk, uh, no forks, uh, less branchy, taller and bigger. And the timber species we're talking about here are oak and gean, uh, sycamore, uh, birch uh, and beech. And then prior to ash dieback, you know, we were very keen on collecting from ash. And this is in the expectation or, or the hope that by collecting from better form parent trees, we might be able to produce straighter, less branchy offspring which would be better for, for growers that are interested in, in timber production. So really we're talking about something equivalent to very basic 
selection or, or breeding that farmers have been doing with, with food plants and livestock over hundreds or, or thousands of years. And that's simply selecting from the most useful individuals uh, in this context anyway, and then and then breeding from them. And this raises a number of questions. And I'm just going to run through these very quickly. I don't think I've got time to go into them, but we can come back to them in the discussion if, if these interest you. So how much better for timber production are better formed trees? And the answer is they they really are are much better that um, small improvements in the in the length or, or quality of logs translates to big increases in both the volume and, and the value of, of timber coming off off the saw. Uh, next question, do better form parent trees give rise to better form offspring? Uh, the answer to that is is yes, uh, somewhat better, uh, but but not but not always. You just end up in the offspring with a slightly higher proportion of good offspring if you have good parents. Does seed collection from better form parent trees lead to a narrowing of the genetic base in the offspring? This is uh, sometimes an issue that uh, conservationists bring up. Uh, and the answer is not, not really. It's actually very hard to narrow genetic variation in, in populations of, of trees. Trees are the most genetically diverse organisms on Earth, and it's actually quite a difficult thing to do. And then finally, could could use of better form trees have negative or even positive effects on on conservation? Um, and it seems the answer to that, to that is we don't have much of an effect because most species associated with trees, so flora, fungi, invertebrates, birds, etc., don't really care at all whether that tree is growing growing straight or not. There may be a few species um, that rely on knot holes or decaying branches that might be adversely affected, but really um, the effects are pretty small. So what are the options to collect from better form trees? Here's Dave again, he's starring right the way through my, uh, my show here. Um, firstly, can you choose better form trees within a wood and just try and collect from those? Um, so yes, in, in theory, you can do that. Um, it's a little bit tricky typically because there's a limited number of these better trees in in any one wood um no let's get to those sideways here so the question here is in, in an oak wood like this is it worth um working your way through the wood and just collecting from from straighter trees and trying to separate those out as a separate collection for for growers who are interested in in timber production, or if you're lucky enough to have, have trees like that, well, um, and this is a, a really super tree on a on an estate uh, down in the borders, uh, there has to be some expectation that acorns coming from trees like this will give you, give you better offspring. Um, there, there is a, a tricky thing here that in any one year, only a minority of, of the trees in the wood actually produce seed. So it's hard to find enough of these better quality trees uh, to produce seed in any one in any one particular year. You're normally, as as Craig mentioned, you're normally toiling to get um, the sort of twenty or thirty trees that should be in a collection as it is. And so when you limit it to just uh, the better trees, it, it's kind of tricky. Uh, and Sod's law comes in and seems to play a role. You struggle through a wood looking for your for your better trees, <clears throat> and it turns out in that particular year. Um, it's very often they're the ones that are not producing seed. Geneticists tell us that, that doing this only produces a very slight increase in, in quality. And that's because those better trees in the wood also have the genes in them for the more kind of negative qualities um, of all the other sort of poorer brothers and sister trees in the wood. So you only make a, a, a small improvement. Um, but my view is it, it's it's worthwhile uh, where you can do it. It's it's worthwhile doing, um, provided that uh, you can separate out that collection and signal that it's potentially better better quality. So our next option is: Can you choose better woods? Woods where, on average, the form of the trees is is better. And the answer to that is is yes. And this is the basis for what Scottish forestry calls. Uh, selected seed stands because they're selected to be better than the average 
stand of trees, that species. So this is a selected seed stand not far from Fort Augustus of, but it has both silver and, and downy birch in it, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's selected mainly for the fact that it's silver birch. They're also called registered seed stands because they appear on this mysterious thing called the, the register of basic material. Um, go again, another picture. The register of basic material looks like looks like this. This is just a, a page from it. Um, and it just gives a, a list of the seed stands, um, number, uh, the species, their location. And in this column here called category, it has SE for selected or SI for source identified. So selected means these stands are better than average timber form and SI means source identified. So more sort of run of the mill seed stands uh, that, are, that are, are useful, uh, particularly useful for conservation. So another question that's very important for seed collectors, is, is it feasible to collect from, from better form trees? And the answer is that it's definitely uh, trickier to collect from taller, straighter trees. Is Dave again? We can't get away from him. Uh, best form trees typically require climbing, uh, except for oak, of course, where the, the acorns come down to us. Uh, and this adds significantly to costs, um, particularly because now to be legal, you re require a team of two qualified climbers. And that's typically going to set you back uh, best part of £600 a day. Uh, so, to sum up, the better form stands and trees are harder to find and harder and more uh, costly to collect from. Having said all that, collections are sometimes made from these selected seed stands in Scotland, uh, but not very often. Uh, it's mainly oak and birch that are the, the target for collecting from selected seed stands. Now, the final way in, into this problem is to do what is termed tree breeding or, or tree improvement. Examples of this um, is from domestic apple. This slide is, is birch, by the way. Domestic apple, in which selection has been happening, uh, according to geneticists who peer into their DNA for about 4,000 years. It's taken that time to produce your, your garden apple tree or more recently uh, Sitka spruce. Improved Sitka spruce is now the industry norm for planting spruce. So in collecting, uh, so in, in tree breeding, we collect the very best trees, which we call plus trees, and these come from multiple woods across a region, uh, and we bring them together so as they breed one with, with another, and they're planted out in things called seed orchards. Uh, and these seed orchards typically have between about 40 and 100 parent trees. Uh, so that's what you can see here. Um, on the right hand side is, is a seed orchard of silver birch that's been established uh, in a polytunnel. That is one way of doing it and has the advantage of the seed being produced very quickly and you can control the amount of pollen coming in from the general environment to, to avoid that kind of what is well, it's termed pollen contamination for people who run orchards, or you can have it outdoors. The one on the picture on the left is from, from Forest Start down in Shropshire, uh, who have a, a, a seed orchard of, of birch there. So the process is that you collect twigs from the plus trees, uh, which was Dave was doing in the previous slide. Uh, you graft them onto rootstock and you form grafted trees, rather like your garden apple. And these are then grown in these orchards. So uh there's advantages to this approach uh you have low cost of seed collection once the seed orchards are established uh, on the other hand you have high upfront costs but those are typically borne by research organizations rather than by by seed collectors or or by uh, nurseries uh, you have the advantage that both female and male parents are of good form and that tends to lead to to better offspring uh, the disadvantage is it's an expensive process and it's very challenging to organize and there's a very long lead in for some for some species especially oak which is one way that we'd really like to uh, to progress with but of course it takes 
decades after you've planted your grafted trees until you get acorns and even then you're getting them in small quantities. So I've been involved uh, over the years with an organization uh, called Future Trees Trust uh, that does tree breeding in, in broadleaves. Um, I've run their, their birch program for 25 years and I've also been involved with their oak program. And just very quickly mention this is the state of play. So for silver birch, we have a collection of plus trees called South Scotland and North England. And there's lots of seed and plants available from commercial nurses with that. Now we have a plus tree collection for, for Highland Scotland, but there's yet no orchard for that. Uh, and we've nearly completed a plus tree collection for downy birch, which um, is ongoing at the moment. Sycamore. Uh, we have several orchards from sycamores that are collected across, right across the UK. Those are just coming on stream. Gein, there are four orchards um, from trees in the south of England. Oak, we have several orchards, but they're too young to produce acorns. We've ongoing work with sweet chestnut and beech. Ash, that was a sad story. We put 20 years of work into that. Improved seed became available the very same month that ash dieback was confirmed uh, so that is no longer of, of any use um, but future trees trust is now the main organization that's using these techniques to produce disease resistant ash so to sum up where would we like to get to well the ideal situation we'd have a range of, of different seed collections for different purposes um, source id uh, stands obviously for use in conservation we've heard about that a, a lot today and then the use of selected seed stands and seed orchards for growers that are particularly interested in, in timber production. And this is a picture of a stand from uh, improved birch that was produced uh, under a research program by Aberdeen University uh, uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And this is planted a few kilo kilometers from my house. And it's looking very fine. So that's me. Fabulous, Rick. Thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us. Doesn't it just prove to you that the research is, is um, well, research is either to find if something works or doesn't work, but in that picture there you can absolutely see that it has worked, hasn't it? That you've got beautiful examples of lovely straight um, trees there with you. Thank you very much indeed. And now Tasha's hand is up. Tasha, do you want to come in? Um, I was just going to ask there about, um, well, it's just really interesting the genetics side of things, um, especially for here, because we do have some ash. Um, we also have ash dieback, but there are still trees that are looking resistant to the disease so far. Um, I have a little bit of ash growing in the tree nursery because I just thought it was of such a good uh, species to try and keep growing. So I would love to know a bit more about the disease resistant work that's going on there. So, in summary, it seems that about 99% of ash trees are susceptible to the disease. We're expecting a mortality in the, in the high 90%. It happens very quickly with young trees. It takes much longer with, with older trees. So the fact that you have some older trees that are not showing symptoms, it might be more uh, a matter of of time before that shows up, but really we're not sure because you know we're all on a, on a steep learning curve. Uh, in in the wood, in the oak wood where I've been collecting acorns, we have a, 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 a railway cutting goes through, and there's lots of ash regeneration. And in the first year, we had one dead ash tree from ash die. About the second year, it was 28. The third year, it was 350. And in the fourth year, we only had about 20 that weren't affected. Uh, and when you do the maths with this, I had I had school kids doing uh, little projects in here. It does come down to, we seem to have about 1% of trees that are showing, showing resistance. So that's kind of backing up what is being shown by the scientists. So all, all that Future Tree Trust is doing, they have, uh, they've been looking in the landscape for apparently resistant trees, uh, taking graft material of that, moving it in, and then assessing when they breed those trees together, they're assessing the offspring to see uh, to what extent they're getting resistance or not. 
Uh, I'm not up with the details of that. It will be on it be on the website, but I know they are finding trees that are genuinely resistant. And so the next stage is what proportion of the offspring, if you take two apparently resistant trees, what proportion of the offspring are going to be resistant? Because they won't all be, um, but we'd anticipate there would be a higher number of, of, of trees that are resistant. And coming back to you, I would definitely encourage you to carry on growing ash um, because you will have some resistant trees on egg. You might not have very many of them, um, but it would be you have to you have to anticipate that you are going to get a large number of deaths in, in young trees that you plant out. Uh, but I would say, you know, carry on monitoring as much as you can. Don't ever collect seed from a, a tree that's showing disease resistance because its offspring are likely to be. Um, so just keep monitoring the situation, keep a small number of ash trees ticking over and, and see what you learn. Thanks very much. That's really helpful. Um, do they start showing signs after about four or five years of the disease? Mm, quicker. Pardon? Quicker. Yeah, it, seedlings will die. Seedlings will die, uh, you know, uh, uh, in pretty short order. If you have diseased trees in the in the vicinity, if you haven't, then you know you, you, if you haven't got ash trees growing next to your nursery, the chances are that you won't have too many spores coming in and causing problems. It's trees that are in the vicinity of of uh, trees with the disease that are susceptible. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one last question. I'm sorry, I've got lots of questions. Um, the Fund, uh, do you know of any funding that's available for seed orchards in Scotland? Because I've seen a lot of funding in England, but none in Scotland. Uh, my quick answer to that is I haven't kept up with that. I think you'd probably be better talking to Dave or, or Craig about that. We have these. Uh, yeah, pass it over to you guys. I don't know the answer. Yeah, it's I've certainly only seen the English one. It's, that's the last two years that, that's came out. So. Yeah, it's not has not made its way to Scotland as of yet. There was some talk of it, but uh, with sort of recent cuts in funding, it may not be at the the higher end of the sort of to do list. Who would we ask or try and push for that? Because I think it's really important in Scotland, especially with the vast quantity of small tree nurseries that are popped up in places. I think getting a seed orchard, even though for egg. <laughs> We are a seed orchard on the whole island, but it would be really good to be able to actually um, decide on a piece of land that actually was for our seeds, future seed source, because that's where I'm concerned about is 20, 25, 40 years time, because all our woodlands are so old. I could certainly, I could ask around to see, but it would be sort of pushing the, the forestry, well, for FLS really would be, be the people that we would need to need to be nudging on that. Do you think it's worthwhile if we're all uh, join forces, as it were, to try and push them all independently, but together? Pitch up at their door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there are certainly certainly some species I ideally wish I'd done this with sort of 20 or 30 years ago. You know, hazel is the obvious hazel. one. <laughs> it would just make life so much easier than, than trawling around through the woods looking for 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 trees so uh, i've just set up a, a couple of orchards for for wild crab apple just in the, this last year um okay. and that that was a, a species for which you definitely need an orchard there's actually no other way of doing it more or less so yeah they definitely have their place and it's something we haven't done and should be doing well folks i will leave you to organize your campaign <laughs> <laughs> Out with this session. Thank you all so very much for your contributions today. It has been really informative. I've certainly learned an awful lot in the chairs that we've been together and I hope you have as well. Um, this video will be going live onto um, live. It will be the recording will be going onto YouTube. I would imagine that will be within the next week. Uh, Philippa, your hands hands up very quickly. Oh, you're on mute. Let me unmute you. I can't you need to do it yourself sorry hi hi I'm, I'm a complete outsider beginner i have maybe a stupid question but um how much space would you need to have a seed orchard and could you have one in a city um i'm really interested in uh, i'm in paisley in scotland and i'm really interested in um 
community gardens, urban growing, maybe this is a completely crazy question, maybe you can't have such a thing. And and for a beginner seed saver, are there any tips of um, places to go to, to get information? I'm sorry, that's a very all over the question, all over the place question. Um, Who's able the, to answer that quickly for us? I, I could do the the orchard one. I think you'd require too much space because for an orchard you have to have trees planted quite far apart. So as they get lots of sunlight, you know, five, six, seven meters apart, you need ideally at least forty or fifty trees, and that adds up to quite a, a fair sized piece of ground. So I, I I'm not sure that would be feasible. And well, it may be. I don't know, but that's that's what you need anyway. Um, Thank the you. Other, yeah, the other question I'm going to pass back to Craig and Dave. I think. Yeah, I think the, the first thing would be looking at the FRM register. So that does have a list of, sort of the registered stands. But but on the sort of natural source identified populations, no, there isn't really anywhere to sort of grab that information. And again, it's a sort of big reason that Dave's doing the work he's doing here for us on starting to map it. So it is almost sort of getting out there yourself and starting to map what's around you, really. So thank you. Thanks very much, Philippa, for that question. OK, folks, um, time has, has run out and sorry for running over for a few minutes. But again, once again, thanks for your contributions. Thanks for your questions. Um, I'll be in touch with you to ask for a little bit of feedback, as always, so that we can make sure that we are providing the service that you need and to the quality that you expect from CWE. In the meantime, have a very lovely Friday afternoon and I hope you get sunshine over the weekend. Take care, folks. Well done, Sharon, for organising. Yeah. Well done, Thank Sharon. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.